Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth with your host, Angelo Ponzi. I am Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Today I'm excited to continue our discussion with Maricel Reese, CEO of Human Options, and Don Reese, CEO of The Wooden Floor, to discuss the business of building and running a nonprofit. Uh, thank you for you listeners for tuning in to this part two. Um, if you're jumping in here, there is a part one, or actually I'll go in even a part zero back in February <laughs> of, of this year. So I suggest at the end you listen to all three of these in order. I think it would make a lot of sense, but mm-hmm. you can jump in at any time to really benefit from this great discussion. So before we start, I'm gonna this, we'll shorten the descriptions of who you guys are this time around because hopefully by now they've heard it twice. <laughs> and so just... Put it back in perspective. Uh, Marisol, I'm going to go with you first this time. Sure. I, uh, I get the great honor and privilege of leading Human Options as the CEO. Human Options has been in Orange County for 38 years, and we're in the business of healthy relationships. Okay. I, my name is Don Reese, and I'm the CEO of The Wooden Floor. I've, uh, the Wooden Floor is uh, celebrating its 36th anniversary this year, and our goal today is to transform young people in low-income communities through the power of dance and access to higher education. Well, fantastic. And I'm Angelo Ponzi, uh, CEO of the Ponzi Group, and I am a for-profit company. Just thought <laughs> I'd throw that in there. <laughs> One of the things I talk about a, a lot in, in my business consultation is about planning. I'm a big believer in three-year planning and really setting that tone and making sure everybody's on the right page. But one of these recent surveys that I've seen has said that 90% of business leaders say their strategic plans fail because of poor implementation. Mm-hmm. So we can plan until the cows come home, but if we don't know how to implement it, we tend to get into trouble. So if we think about the nonprofits here then and look at the statement, is this reflective of what we see here in Orange County? And do you see people stumbling and really finding it difficult to implement the plans they put into place. Oh, oh, this is Don. I'll start. Um, so, you know, I think it has to do with where um, nonprofits sometimes see strategy and strategic planning, the work coming from in the budget cycle. Um, they Sometimes they look at it as overhead, and we talked about that <laughs> in our first episode, is that um, a lot of times you have restricted dollars through grant funding and other um, funders, not uh, supporters. Mm-hmm. And so to get that unrestricted dollar for strategic planning sometimes is a challenge. And so just to start there. Um, but for those organizations that do invest in strategic um, planning. Um, one of the things that we do at the Wooden Floor that we actually set a 10-year vision um, tied to also the length of their students are with us for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, we set a bold vision in 2010 20 to 2020, and we've just actually passed our 2131 vision. Wow. Um, because I wanted to make sure before we uh, came out of this 2020 vision that we already had one teed up because I believe we're going to start living into it because what I believe in strategic planning is and when you find the great, a great consultant to work with as well is that you start living it as you're working on this strategy and so you mm-hmm. get buy-in from the whole organization mm-hmm. so now that we're getting in those two to three year strategic plan which I call chapters in a book to further the vision there's already organizational buy-in so I'm not having to say okay staff we have another 10 objectives to do you sure. know it's it's part of our daily work and we also take um, part of it is we also incorporate um, not only our students our our parents our alumni our um, board staff we also go externally we go to our um, supporters uh, stakeholders foundation partners and also the systems level people Department of Ed or people that we want to get feedback from. And so by doing that 360 look at what we're trying to accomplish, it's always, again, to what I said in the last episode, student-centered, you know, making sure that at all the decisions we do, it's guiding that. Okay. I, I think similar. What I would add is that Human Options, we actually had done strategic plans for various years, and every time the strategic plan was completed, you needed to update it again, right? So sure. it just it was it was maybe not a living document the way you really wanted it to do. Um, recently, we actually went through a theory of change process, which is a living, breathing document, and that process was really taking a thirty thousand foot view at what the issue is that we're trying to solve, and so it really broke up that idea of. Oh, you know, we're here to um, end, the, end the cycle of relationship violence. Well, yes, we're here to do that, but that's not the root cause. We need to really understand what we're doing. It. And then it allowed us to think about our values. It allowed us to think about key strategies across the organization uh, or an organizational strategy and vision versus just 
this program's going to do this and this program's going to do this. And so as we as we really looked at that, I think for us, one of the things that... Is that your phone? Yeah, we got a phone buzzing in here. <laughs> so there a big oh, fly or a phone. <laughs> how distracting. <laughs> um, but... Um, <laughs> But one of the one of the things I mean, in one of the earlier episodes, we talked about how um, people get really stuck and 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 thinking small, and so that that I think when you get really encapsulated into these are the five things I'm supposed to do because my strategic plan said to do it, it makes it hard to grow. Our theory of change was designed in a way where we're constantly making decisions based on reflecting: is this working? Is it not? Mm-hmm. So we have four areas of impact. We're constantly looking at: are we achieving what we wanted to do in those fair areas of impact? And if not, change the strategy. And so we're not locked into a particular strategy. We're in, we're locked into outcomes, we're locked into vision, and so it's a strategic direction more than it is a strategic plan. Um, and then we operationalize that from year to year. Okay. It, and, and by taking it that way, I think in both your cases, you can react much it's faster, iterate, it's right? Iterate. It's iterative. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's interactive. You're not waiting a year to see if you've had the outcomes. You can identify and make changes right away. And I think you both said this is about getting the staff, if you will, buy-in. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I, I was talking to somebody uh, the other day, and and I said, well, how do you, you know, think, what are my clients and how do you, you know, you're happy like where they're going with the new campaign? And it was like, well, what campaign? I have no idea what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. And so I, I'm a big believer in internal marketing as much I am, as I am in external marketing because the staff really has to understand because they might be in HR, they might be in accounting or wherever. They walk out the door, they're still, they're an ambassador for the organization, right? right? And they need to be able to know what's going on so they can speak on behalf. And that, that's all leaders. I believe all staff are leaders in our organization. And so day one through onboarding process, um, they're involved in strategy. That's the first, my first board meeting um, when I onboard uh, board members as well. It's two hours about strategy. You know, most times you'll do onboarding with board members and it's about the minutia of, you know, being a board member. And we do that on a completely other meeting. <laughs> Meeting. I spent two hours just on where we've been, how we did, how we've made the decisions. The decisions have been codified in the organization, so they come to the meeting and they're like, "Hey, what about scaling to Washington D.C.?" You're like, "Well, we've done that," <laughs> you know. Um, and so they know what our big vision is, and then they can figure out how they contribute to that, you know. So it's really important that, especially on the staff level too, who is usually the drivers of those individual initiatives, that they also feel like they're um, they're really recognized for their efforts as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I, I asked this question. I'm just going to read a, a, in some of my presentations. What business are you in? And these are these are CEOs. And in many cases, and I heard back, I'm in the business of making widgets. Or mm-hmm. you're asking an IT person, it's like I deal with the technology issues. Or, but that's not really what I was after. Uh, and I'll read a few of these. And I did some research on it. So the the CEO of Black and Decker once said, "People don't go into a DIY, DIY store because they need a drill. They go in because they need a hole in the wall." Or Harley Davidson doesn't sell motorcycles, it sells the concept of freedom to middle aged men. Or Starbucks doesn't really in the business of coffee, they're in social experience. And Nike isn't in the shoe business, they're in the business of inspiring athletes within all of us. So if we really think about mm-hmm. what business you are in, and again, also it, thinking about your guidance and advice to the listeners. How do you describe the business that you're in to really encapsulate that? And I know you guys have said it, but I want to bring it back so we can make it very succinct for people to listen. Well, in the in the sector, they say in the nonprofit sector, either you're changing a life, you're saving a life. <laughs> you know, I mean, and so um, our business is that um, we're changing lives through um, providing hope and opportunity to young people to move forward. That's the simplest way that I say what I do. Um, then if someone gets really super excited, if I'm on my 30 second, you know, um, uh, discussion networking with somebody and they get excited, like, tell me more. Then I tell them, usually I'm talking about moving um, children forward. Mm-hmm. I don't have to go into all the what of how we're doing it sure. unless they get super excited. But a lot of people get super excited about helping children move forward. And then the way that we're doing it, we can then reinforce that. Sure. So ours is, ours is the same. We're in the business of changing lives and by providing a safe place where they can express themselves and live their lives to their full potential. Okay. But really that changing lives is mm-hmm. just that nugget that really, right. really drives it home. So we think about, we've been talking a little bit about messaging. So we're going to make a move into one of my favorite subjects, marketing, branding, and Great. messaging. Great. And And really... We talk about the business of nonprofit, and so like any other business, people have to know who you are. They have to have some interest in you and hopefully consideration to want to come to a 
a meeting or an event and, and get involved and, and certainly instead of maybe trial it's a, to donate or whatever. So when you think about building that branding strategy for your nonprofits, I don't assume it's any different than I would do for anybody else, but what's that process? And again, you guys are much bigger, been around, much more successful, got some coins in the bank, but some of these other folks really don't. So what advice would you give about the process of building a brand strategy? I'll go to you, Don. So um, if, I, if, again, I step back to that emerging nonprofit all the way to larger organizations and ourselves, it all starts with telling a great story, mm-hmm. making sure that, as um, we were just um, in, in encouraged, is that you want to be able to tell a story of your accomplishment and what you're trying to do. So even if you are starting day one as a nonprofit, you made a difference to help someone change their life, how are you going to do that? Um, and having a tangible story, um, that's what we found is one of the most um, beneficial parts of the journey. But to, to then build a brand that you know stands the test of time, the wooden floor it used to be called St. Joseph Ballet up until 2009. It was around at that point about 25 years and had that established brand in the community. And then we took that opportunity to change our name to the wooden floor. People were like, what this, what's the wooden floor about? And our tagline is, from here you can step anywhere. But that was really a pivotal moment for us because really the the we had a great reputation in the community, but um, the name wasn't really representing the ambition that we had for the children like the vision. and the vision we had. And um, we were not a dance studio. We weren't a pre-professional program. We were really about using dance to help children move forward, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, I had to, that's when I first started working. I have a director of marketing. Um, so we do invest in marketing as well. And we now have a graphic designer full-time as well. And um, it was really important for us to establish the brand around the pillars that we already had established, trust in the community, um, a strong mission, strong results. And then we took that in as we then broke that down into how do we convey that then to all those different audiences. So the parents would hear maybe one thing, the students would hear one thing of why we're changing the name. And then the business community would hear another story, you know, way in a story to how that happened. So we actually had a message matrix in order to make that happen. And then we then added on to top of there. Uh, branding style guides, uh, ways that we always present ourselves. We're very visual heavy. Um, you've seen our work um, mm-hmm. photo driven. And then then it went to that next ring of connections in the community, partnerships, advertising, PR opportunities. Now it's public speaking nationally and getting the word out on the wooden floor. So it had to start at the very beginning, like I said, of that initial story. And what's that message that we crafted to the different audiences because we have multiple audiences. Mm-hmm. Well, I commend you on this, by the way, because I deal with organizations that make one message for five different verticals. And so to actually, now is actually one of my questions about verticalization and really honing yes. in on your audience and, and being relevant to them. Yes. Because if you're not relevant to the audience you're speaking with, they're going to tune you out. Right, right. So, does, uh, Marcel, let's talk about your strategy yeah, and so, how you evolved the brand. Um, what we did is um, shortly after our theory of change, which was really looking at where our strategic direction over the, uh, for the future is we actually then began to engage with a marketing and, and public relations a, a company and they also helped us look at audiences so all of the demographics that we impact were burst, uh, from youth to older adults whether it be for accessing services or supporting the services in some form or fashion and then we really began to unpack like where is this what let's look at the strategic vision like what are the archetypes and those types of things that marketing groups do um, and we intentionally brought in various stakeholders I mean it was a it was a six-month process for us where we brought in board members, staff members, um, clients. We brought in donors, and we really brought them in from a variety of things. Are these the right words? How does this sound? And we sat and listened. There were moments when it was like, whoa, you guys are way bragging. That's not who you are. Or like, you're losing your heart. Or you're too soft. And really making sure that we did that. And and one of the things is is being part of all of those sessions and listening to all the various audience, we began to figure out what the thread was between Mm -hmm. Every audience, and then um, and then came up with messaging, and then tested it with the audience again. And what we found was 90% of the messaging was right on point for all audiences, and the differences were really around age and demographics. And so then we knew we were on to something and knew that when we got to specific audiences for uh, either outreach or any of those different things, we knew how to tailor the story, not the message. Yeah. Um, 
Because our message is still the same. We are who we are. Um, and then the other thing is that what that really showed us is that visually how we were represented in the organization, we needed to have a good identity in, um, in, the, in the nonprofit sector and in the community. And so we, ours actually resulted in a change logo. Um, and when, and again, I mentioned um, what we kept hearing was one of the things that Human Options has always been known for is we've been very heart-centered. We've always really led with our heart. Um, and what we did is we actually... Our, our logo now represents a heart, but it's a, it's a comprehensive heart. Mm -hmm. It's not a simple heart. It's multidimensional, and it's really intended to look at that diversity. It's intended to really, um, again, centering the heart and knowing that that's not what we're going to lose, but it's a, but, but their strength in the logo as well. And so those were things that we kept hearing and resonated. Um, but again, what we did was really we went into it thinking this is this is what we're going to do. Um, we were open to feedback through that marketing process, so we and, and vetted it, and then really felt comfortable. And we've got had a great response so far. I, I commend you as well. I mean, I might take you guys on some calls with me to <laughs> talk to the people across the room. I mean, what you just described is is you know ideal for someone like myself to really dig in, do the research, talk to the customers vet it not only time to do the research but actually go back i mean when i worked with bigger brands we would always did there right? we'd go in we'd do consumer t uh, interviews we'd shape the creative we'd take it back we'd test it if it didn't work we'd go back fix it go back and test it mm -hmm. i remember one time with um uh, working for uh, uh, dove hair care and actually uh, trying to do dove hair care in turkey or something like i don't know 37 back and forth test and then they brought our company in to do copy testing and we were helped to solve it but they just couldn't find the right mix of messaging and so I, I really commend you guys on that the other thing I wanted to compliment you on uh, Marcella is you know that I saw you when you first gave me your business card it was last fall mm -hmm. and then when we were here the, back in February you handed me your a package actually with your new business card and the the logo change was was fantastic I, I immediately got it thank you but the one thing you gave me was a coaster mm -hmm. and I called you up on it because it had a nice saying in it but I went hey that would be great if it was actually by some of the kids and you go well it was but it's it's a beautiful piece of art, and you know, for me, it got a little emotional. I, I should have taken a picture. It, it literally, it's the only outside thing I have that's mm. still sitting on my desk because oh, I really oh, fell in love nice. with it, with the the visual of the what it, the visualization of it, but but what it meant. But so when you have do stuff like that, and, and we talked really about messaging and positioning, but what are some of those tactical strategies that that you guys? find beneficial and for the audience that they might find beneficial we've heard pr we've heard advertising we're public speaking but well i was gonna i was gonna how add they the, <laughs> the, also that marcel and i are both very involved in the community mm -hmm. um some ceos um, will stay in their offices <laughs> and you know you're you're not going to meet new people that will help you or they'll meet people maybe just in the nonprofit sector you know they don't meet um, community leaders educational leaders because everyone will know somebody that like yourself angelo that gets moved by marcel mission right and that um, that you know that struck an, a, a chord with you and so I think for um, for us it's um, we have to be out in the community we have to be out um, meeting new people evangelizing um, for our missions we love them care about them we want to make sure more people know about the uh, students and the impact that we have in children's lives and um, you know I think for us it's it's that storytelling part that if you do have someone that really connects with you in some way, then you can share more, maybe more vulnerably about some a story that happened on campus. You heard something happen with a family. Um, for ourselves, we really um, sometimes hold that a little closer because we, we want to make sure that we're not exploiting that family's journey or the student's journey. We actually like to talk about it being in the student's voice. And mm -hmm. so most of the time you'll see, like you saw with the coaster, you'll see that it will see the student's quotes there. Like we have a t-shirt right now that says, I am I am courageous. I am. And it's like, it's a pyramid of all their words. And someone said, where did those words come from? And someone said, oh, it was in one of our videos. And, the, and we just had a staff person just start writing all the words that they said, how fantastic they felt about themselves from being at the wooden floor. So, you know, I think for us, it's really about making sure that we're out in the community on top of making sure that we, we also um, use our um, connections within our staff and our board to be evangelists in the community as well. And then our supporters also are evangelists for mm -hmm. us as well. So it's how do you help them have those words, those resources, what they need in order to get that word out for you? Well, that's the emotional connection, I think, is you know really a, a, 
such a key in in driving people to really connect with it. I mean, I know I, yeah. I have, and and you know now I've met you guys several times, and inside and outside the studio, and so you you start to really trust trust and <laughs> yeah. confidence, and but really understand the purpose and the message. And it's back to typical advertising awareness, consideration, you know, interest trial, all those things. And so I, I think that's so important. And I would say consistency. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think what, like, what, what's interesting and, and one of the things that we're really focused on right now is is um, how do we live it, right? So how do we live the brand? More, mm-hmm. than, more, more than talk about the brand, more than just show the brand, how do we live the brand? And that really is for us internally what our staff is focusing on. How do we talk about the values? How do we acknowledge like when they're happening, when they're not, and really giving our staff an opportunity to share stories. And I, I got to tell you, I was, I, we had an all-staff meeting, and we had just started to really unroll our new brand and really unroll. And the values weren't new because they were all identified by staff mm-hmm. members and people in the community. But as they began to tell the stories, I, I can't tell you how proud I was of every staff person who shared a story about, like, this is how we're living in genuity, and this is why partnerships are so mm-hmm. important. And they would share, and they would share that, like, we had a client who was in need of something and we reached out to you know one of our community partners and because of that partnership we were able to exponentially assist this client in moving forward and getting their own place in the in the community to live in and so to me i think the ambassadors that you have within your team um, they're not just ambassadors in terms of being able to here's the five things i'm supposed to sure. say right. but really like your experience with and, and you know what your experience with the people that worked at human options or at the wooden floor it has to live the brand they have to go gosh you know i don't know what your values are but i'm experiencing i think they're empathy you know i think it's it's individuality mm-hmm. I, gosh you're always curious whatever those are but they're you're feeling that from the people that you're seeing yeah so I want to ask each one of you, and these will probably be our parting questions, tell me one story, and I don't care if it's from the perspective of, of one of your, your audiences or it's from a staff member, but something you went, man, this was the greatest thing that happened, or just, let's talk, get some heartstrings out mm-hmm. there. So who wants to go first? Well, I'll go. All right, Don. One popped in my head. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's, there's so I many. Saw, I saw you. <laughs> it's like, I'm here. I'll, I'll do, I think we have five minutes, so I'll do a couple minutes um, and give the, um, Marisol a rest. Um, but, um, well, I, we have a graduating senior this year. I won't say her name, but um, her mom and dad had a lot of challenges uh, 10 years ago when she started with us. Um, the dad was um, uh, two strikes and unfortunately had a third strike um, incident, had to go to prison. Um, the mom had, she was the f- full source of income at the time. And um, the mom immediately came to the wooden floor and said, <laughs> she's brand new to the organization, but she knew we were her only anchor out there. Said, I don't drive, I don't have a job, I have no money. Uh, what are we going to do? And our team just wrapped them in and said, okay, this is ter- sometimes not traditionally what we have just all of that come to us all at one mm-hmm. time. But we, we said, okay, let's first you got to get um, housed. And so mm-hmm. we ended up calling our home, homeless services partners that we have and saying, is there any way you could take this family in at least for a short term? And then let's help us figure out the next step for them, which was a job. And so we helped her get a job, the mom. Um, we also provided emotional support to um, our student and her brother, who was at the time, who also had um, some um, disability as well. And so we were able to anchor that mom, help her get on the path. And what she is over the 10 years, she's been a beautiful advocate for our work. Um, just so grateful, sits in our lobby, will do any single kind of volunteerism that she can do in order to help um, us because she's so grateful. That's her way to show gratitude, right? So fast forward, um, her husband, I don't know how, but he ended up coming out of um, jail. He's now reunited with the family. They're now in their own apartment. He's working now um, her brother is in um, community college and um, he's doing terrific um, with his disability and now she's set to graduate and she's looking she's all, she's applying to both private and um, public universities mm-hmm. and we're waiting on any minute to hear what she sure. is accepted and so for the wooden floor you know um, one of the most poignant things um, I can't almost said her name uh, the mom said to us one time was that the only time the values of the of my life are are the same is when we're in this one bedroom together or when the children are here at the wooden floor. In between, my values are not transferred. Mm-hmm. 
And that was so powerful to us. Yeah. The very emotional story. I can see you got emotional yeah. while you're talking. Um, All right. Marcella? You know, I, I'll share a story about a young boy that came into our residential or emergency shelter. And he was about six years old. Um, and his mom and he and his little sister were be in our emergency shelter. And um, mom had fled an abusive relationship. And this little boy had so much anger and so much, so many emotions that he just didn't know how to express. And so he would throw things or he would yell or he would kick and he would hit. Um, and our children's program staff really worked with him. And I think one of the important things to note is that most children that are witnessing domestic violence will either become, th- th- there's 33% of children that witness domestic violence can become abusers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of them will become victims, right? And so left unhealed, that's what's going to happen. So this, here, you know, here we have this six-year-old boy who has no way of really positively expressing himself. And we have a resident within that um, our emergency shelter, which is actually a, a puppet, and it's about the size of a four- and five-year-old child, and he talks to the kids, and he talks to them about, you know, taking deep breaths and calming down and what he does when he's angry and what, he's do- what, what he does when he's hurting, and he's really adding words and language to um, vocabulary that young kids don't have. Oftentimes, they, have, they know angry and mm-hmm. they know hurt, but that's yeah. about it. And so, you know, we've gone through this process of teaching the little boy that we'll call Johnny, we t- teaching him, you know, okay, take deep breaths, but, you know, what would Wally do right now, and count to five, and doing those types of things, and um, a day rolled around when his little sister um, came in, and she was very angry, and she started throwing things, and Johnny turns to her and says, okay, what would Wally do, mm. and he uh, says, uh. you know, take a deep breath, and so to me, um, that is so powerful when you can get a young child to really transfer that immediately, sure. and to see the transformation in this young child, and it was something where I think mom just really noticed, right, that what it was is all of a sudden, we had focused on feelings, we had focused on emotions, he was in a safe place where he could actually talk about it, and now he was actually doing that with his small sister, um, and to us, again, that's, that's a child who's going to grow up, and, um, and he's now hopefully not going to not going to live the life that he could have lived right. or would have lived. Right. Fantastic. I, I am so honored and proud to have both of you back here again and, and humbled, actually. These are wonderful stories and great insights for the community, and I, I'm so happy that uh, you came back. That is our Thank time. You. Thank you. So, uh, Marcella, how can they contact you and reach you? Sure. I am at mreels at humanoptions.org. You can also visit our website, humanoptions.org, and I, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. There you go. Don? Thank you, Angelo. Uh, Don Reese at uh, Don S. Reese at LinkedIn, Don S. Reese at Twitter, and thewoodenfloor.org. Oh, fantastic. Well, you can thank you again for joining us at the cafe today, both you two and the audience. You can find out more about me and read my blogs at theponzagroup.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. You can also subscribe to the show, and I hope you do, at the Business Growth Cafe. We are also on many of the platforms that are around the world, iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud. Join me next week for lunch at the Business Growth Cafe. And thank you guys so much. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.